it was my intent as we start this series on First Peter. I'm not sure how many sermons I'll be in First Peter in between Ray preaching. I thought that I would just preach an overview of the whole chapter this morning. That was my intent when I began looking at First Peter some weeks ago. And then as I continued to labor and study, I finally determined that we might make it halfway through the first verse this morning. <laughs> Not much farther. Um, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Who is this man, Peter? So let's see if we can set the stage a little bit for what we will read in the verses that follow by looking at the man, Peter, this apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, he is known to us as the chief of the apostles. Simon, as he is known in his Hebrew name, Simeon in Hebrew, Simon in Greek, renamed by Christ. Cephas, or Peter. Simon Peter is how he is often referred to. It's interesting in John 1.42, the language that is employed and Jesus renames him. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. Now, if you know much about the life of Peter in the Gospels, you'll know that that's not the only time that Christ looked at Peter. And by looking, we certainly don't just mean that Jesus saw him with his eyes and comprehended the image in his brain. There's much more communicated in that verb, look. Perhaps as you, you will do as I did when I read that verse, my thoughts immediately ran to Luke 22, when Jesus looked at Peter again. Immediately, while he, Peter, was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Jesus looked at Peter. Well, his occupation is known to us as a fisherman, a man after my own heart. We first encounter Peter on the Sea of Galilee, and that's where we'll see him the last time that Christ sees him. He's once again fishing in the Sea of Galilee, and there they are reconciled. So he was a simple man. The Pharisees considered him unlearned. I think by the language that is employed here in his epistles and his eloquent sermons recorded for us in the book of Acts, he must have been a quick study because he's anything but unlearned in the Bible. His family is known to us. We know that his father was Jonah, Simon Bar-Jonah, the son of Jonah, was a fisherman. They were in the fishing business, the family occupation. His brother Andrew was also one of the twelve. In fact, it was Andrew that brought Peter to Jesus. We know also that he was married. Scripture doesn't tell us this directly. It says that Jesus went to the home of his mother-in-law. You can't have a mother-in-law without having a wife. So we know from Scripture that Peter was married. Paul also mentions that Peter was married in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, what we don't know from Scripture, but what we learn from the early church fathers is the tradition that Peter's wife was crucified just before Peter himself was crucified. Eusebius tells us in that 4th century chronicle of the early church that Peter watched while his wife was led to the cross and offered her just simple words, Remember the Lord. If Eusebius is to be believed, and we have no reason to believe he shouldn't be, then Peter followed his wife and his only request was that he be crucified upside down. He was not worthy to be martyred in the same manner as his Lord Jesus. Well, Peter's role. We looked at his name, his occupation, his family. What was his role? There are four lists of the disciples in the Bible. Three of the Gospels and another in Acts. And each of those times, Peter is listed first as the chief of the apostles. And then clearly his leadership is on display when we get to the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. There is more information about Peter 
in the New Testament than any other character other than Jesus. Peter was the leader of the apostles. Well, what about his character? What kind of man was this Peter? Well, he was passionate. I suppose that's the kindest way to put it. <laughs> he was a man who early in his life was characterized by anger. Uh, a man of great passion was Peter who would learn as he followed Jesus and see him suffer and die to master his passions. We think in Matthew 14 of Peter walking on the water. He sees Jesus on the water and he gets out of the boat and starts walking to Christ. And then is afraid, right? Lord, save me, he says. He was brave and then he was terrified. Mountaintops and valleys in the life of the apostle Peter. He wasn't afraid to be a violent man. Even up to the very end of Jesus' ministry, Peter still didn't quite get it, right? He thought that Jesus was going to come in the tradition of the kings like David and throw off the yoke of the Romans and lead the Jewish people to a kingdom here and now, right? Give the Romans the fist. And we'll establish another Jewish kingdom and all live happily ever after. And so when the, the servants of the high priest, the soldiers came to seize Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did Peter do? He pulled out his sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. I don't think Peter was aiming for his ear. <laughs> I think he was probably aiming for a better blow. But he cut off his ear and Christ, of course, healed Malchus and told Peter to put, his, well, put away his sword. His kingdom was not of this world. Well, the, we see Peter again on the shores of the Sea of Galilee being reconciled to Jesus. One of the most precious accounts of the mercy and grace of our Savior. It says when Jesus, or when Peter recognized Jesus on the shore, he didn't wait for the boat to be pulled in close and wade ashore. He plunged into the sea. A passionate man was Peter. He wanted dearly to be with his Lord. And so we we see this picture of reconciliation. Let's turn there to John 21 and, and read the words how Jesus so tenderly sets things right with Peter. In John 21, in verse 7, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. He wanted to be with Jesus. Well, they had a simple breakfast on the shore there and picking up in verse 15, the Bible tells us that when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He, Jesus, said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. And you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. Now, it's interesting to compare and contrast the first follow me with the last follow me, right? When Jesus at the beginning of their relationship looked at the fishermen and said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, right? Peter had a little idea of what that might involve. Surely he couldn't have known all that would be suffered by Jesus himself and by Peter, especially martyrdom 
suffering awaited Peter. The first time, Peter didn't really have the opportunity to count the cost. The second time, surely he knew what following Christ would cost him. And he followed him anyway. Follow me. Simple words would cost Peter his life. Well, uh, we know, of course, what lay ahead for Peter. Not riches and honor, not heaven on earth, not ease and comfort. Suffering and martyrdom, ultimately. Well, back to our text. Peter, we've learned a little bit about who Peter is, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to be an apostle of Jesus Christ? Well, the, we believe the Bible teaches that there are offices in the church, really two offices, although there are some others mentioned, but two primarily in the here and now. That's the office of pastor, elders, shepherds, sometimes called bishops as well, those that will lead and are apt to teach seems to be the distinguishing mark of elders and pastors. And the only qualification that differs from that of the, the chief servants in the church, which are the deacons. So pastors and deacons are the offices of the church. Well, what are we to make with this title of apostle? Are there apostles in the church today? Well, some would certainly believe that there are, right? We might say that the, that the Bible teaches this about apostles, that there's a, a specific title of apostle and there's a general sense. So an apostle with a capital A versus an apostle with a little a, right? I mean, the common usage of an apostle is just one who carries a message or a messenger. Uh, we see that in passages like 2 Corinthians 8.23, where if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers, apostles um, of the churches to the glory of Christ. That's in the common usage, one who carries a message. Well, Peter is not here referring to the common usage. He's using the specific title of apostle with a capital A. Apostleship in its proper sense is an office that is no longer in existence. There are no apostles today. Well, what are the marks of an apostle? What specific things qualified Peter to be an apostle? Well, there are several lists that faithful men have put together, but I think there is some consensus around these three marks of an apostle of Christ Jesus. First, they were eyewitnesses to Christ. They saw Christ. Acts chapter 1 and verse 12 1 Corinthians 15, uh, all of these men, the twelve, and then Paul himself, all were eyewitnesses to Christ. The disciples, that's the capital D disciples, the twelve, walked with Him here on the earth. Paul, of course, encountered Jesus on the Damascus road, but all of them were eyewitnesses to Christ. A second mark of an apostle is that they were personally called and commissioned by Christ. An apostle is personally called and commissioned. Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission went out to the twelve, or to the eleven, and then Matthias would be added to that number in Acts chapter 1. Paul receives his commission in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. So the apostles are personally called and commissioned by Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel that was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul had to say about his calling and commissioning by Christ. The third mark of an apostle is that they worked miracles, signs, and wonders. Miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, this bears a little more explanation. Throughout biblical history, we see these words together usually, miracles, signs, and wonders. God at certain times in specific places empowering specific men use miracle signs and wonders as His stamp of approval, we might say, to authenticate His men, His ministers. If we were to survey Scripture, we'd see that God used miracles in the ministry of Moses and then His servant Joshua. 
Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. Jesus Himself worked many miracles, and then the apostles. Their ministries were all accompanied by miracles, signs, and wonders. Let's look quickly at some of these to make sure that we understand miracles and signs and wonders and their purposes. Let's go first to Exodus chapter 4. God is calling and commissioning Moses here. Well, then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. <laughs> Probably what I would have done, right? I don't like snakes. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Why? Verse 5, That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And he continues in Exodus 4 to show Moses other miracles that he will work for the same purpose, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob had appeared to him. So Exodus 4. Uh, the New Testament. Matthew 10, verses 1 and 8. And he, Jesus, called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. Verse 8. To heal the sick to raise the dead, to cleanse leopard, and to cast out demons. And finally, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says, I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, the twelve. Even though I am nothing, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs wonders, and mighty works. Well, a final passage in this line of thought is Acts chapter 3. And we'll move on. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Well, the purpose of miracles and signs and wonders worked by the apostles of Christ was to give God's stamp of approval, we might say, to their ministry as apostles. Well, what about those who claim to be apostles today? Because we read of them in various places that there are apostles today. You may see billboards that proclaim such and such an apostle, perhaps usually a man and a woman. They're a tag team, the apostle and the apostle, a husband and wife. Are there apostles today? Or what are we to believe about this? Are they apostles? Do they speak with the authority of God? Is God speaking to them, and then their, His words are coming out of their mouths? Well, 
Dr. MacArthur recently said about the new apostolic reformation. It's not new, it's not apostolic, and it's not a reformation. <laughs> They're heretics. Right? This new apostolic reformation. Now I'm not going to give a complete account of this particular movement. It's one of many that come and go and have come and gone since the time of Christ. There's nothing new under the sun, and these heretics are much like the heretics of old. But this particular brand claimed that a second apostolic age began in the year 2001. Not sure why they picked that year. Maybe they could have picked another year. The International Coalition of Apostles claimed that they are heralding the most radical change in the way church is done since the Protestant Reformation. We would agree with that. Not that it's a good thing. We're certainly not commending it, but we would say that it is certainly changing the way historic, orthodox, Protestant Christianity has been practiced. And it's a false gospel. Well, two pastors at MacArthur's Church in California noted that the pricing table for apostleship is curious. This International Coalition of Apostles has a price schedule. You can go on the Internet and sign up to be an apostle. Just pay your fee. They, the two pastors write, there, there's a couple's rate of $650 just in case your wife also happens to be an apostle. You get a two-for-one deal. Put simply, they write, becoming an apostle with the International Coalition of Apostles is only slightly more difficult and expensive than purchasing a season pass to Disneyland. And the same kind of circus is what you might could expect. Well, time doesn't permit us to look at them completely, but suffice it to say that they're false teachers, just like the Bible recounts for us in the book of Jude or perhaps 2 Peter chapter 2. They are charlatans. They are heretics. They preach a false gospel. They are adding to the complete revelation of God, the revelation of man. And we ought to cast them aside. Well, we, knew, we know who the author of our text is this morning. We know that who, what the office of an apostle is. Well, who is his audience? Who is Peter writing to? Well, certainly there is a sense in which he's writing to us. But who was he writing to when he penned these words in the second part of verse 1? To those who are elect exiles, or perhaps your text says pilgrims of the dispersion. And then he lists some places all in modern day Turkey. Asia Minor. He's writing to those saints in, in that place and time. Exiles, pilgrims, we might say by way of explanation, strangers, sojourners, temporary residents, aliens. The people of God living temporarily scattered amongst those who are at home in this world, serving the master of this world. Well, what are we to make of of these titles that Peter gives to the church in Asia Minor, these elect exiles or pilgrims. Well, first, as Christians, we're reminded by our text that our citizenship is not in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our first allegiance is to Christ. Philippians 3.20 tells us that our citizenship is where? In heaven. In Hebrews 13.14 for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Now, I hope it will be said that I'm a patriot of patriots. I don't know that I've met anybody who loves our country more than me. Perhaps Nana. Nana is a patriot as well. I love our country. But my citizenship is first and foremost not of the United States of America. It is in heaven. Our citizenship is not of this world. Well, secondly, we acknowledge that we cannot bring heaven to earth. We cannot bring heaven to earth. We don't believe in a progressive view of history. We're not evolving and getting better towards some utopian vision of life here on earth. We realize that the world that we live in is corrupted by sin. All creation is subjected to futility and groans for redemption, the Bible tells us. Only the return of Christ will bring heaven to earth when all things are made new. 
Well, what we are charged with bringing to earth is not a perfect society, is not heaven, but an aroma of heaven, we might say. A shadow, a glimpse of heaven. While we walk the pilgrim's path here under the sun, we ought to be bringing an aroma of heaven. We're not to grow weary in doing good. Wherever a Christian walks, he ought to be doing good and not growing weary in that doing of good. We are to, as much as it depends upon us, live at peace with all men. Are we peaceable? Or do we seek conflict where perhaps conflict ought not to be? We are to love our enemies. Bless those who curse and revile us. Everybody ought to want to have a Christian for a next door neighbor, right? We ought to be the, the kind of people that make good neighbors. We ought to bless those even that curse us and persecute us to be peaceable and to not grow weary in doing good. Peter will flesh this out for us beginning in, in verse 11. of the first chapter there. I'll pick up in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. Therefore, Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And you... And if you call it on Him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Well, Peter, Peter fleshes some of that out for us, what we are to be about, bringing an aroma of heaven to earth, what our lives ought to look like. Well, what is the message of first Peter what's the, what is Peter trying to communicate to us well if we just look at the the second and third verses here's a summary of the list of deep theological wonders that Peter unveils here in the first three verses of our text he mentions the doctrine of election the elect exiles he speaks of the foreknowledge of God there's a sermon by itself right what does that mean he mentions sanctification. Again, a sermon unto itself. He speaks of the Trinity, the Spirit, God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, all. Obedience. Blood is mentioned, which of course begs for an explanation of what atonement is. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And then grace and peace, reconciliation. Eight theological truths that Peter mentions in the first three verses of his epistle to these elect exiles or pilgrims. But if we were to say there's a central theme to his book, he would say hopeful living in the midst of suffering. Hopeful living in the midst of suffering. He speaks to them of a living hope. Not that there will be a, a hope in the here and now, but through what? through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he concludes his epistle by saying, But may the God of all grace, who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Hopeful living in the midst of suffering. Peter wrote this epistle in the midst of a great persecution in the Roman Empire. He was martyred, most probably as a result of a general persecution of Christians at the hands of the Emperor Nero. And so not just Peter would suffer martyrdom, but many in the fledgling church would be killed for their faith. And so Peter writes to encourage them to live hopefully in the midst of suffering, suffering even unto death. 
hopeful living in the midst of suffering. Well, let me, let me just make some practical application of our text and, and then we'll be finished with this introduction. Practical application. How do we live like pilgrims? I mean, this language of sojourner, stranger, alien, pilgrim is found not just in the first verse here, but it's found several more times in this epistle of Peter's. So, we are to be pilgrims, he tells us, aliens. So how do we, as the people of God, Christians in 21st century America, how do we live like pilgrims? How do we look like pilgrims? Well, just a few things. First is we should talk like aliens, right? Talk like aliens. Speak purposefully, graciously, God-glorifying, Christ-exalting words. You know, speak like aliens. Do you hear people in your daily walk speak like that? Or are their words filled with cursing, grumbling, complaining, bitterness, wrath, envy, and malice? Do we talk like aliens? I wrote down some questions. Am I an encourager? Do we encourage other by, others by our words? Or do we tear down? Do I tear down? I use personal pronouns here in my notes. Am I an encourager? Do I use the words of my mouth to encourage everyone that I meet? Am I discerning with my words? Do I talk when I should be silent? Am I silent when I should speak? Talk like aliens. If we're to be exiles, sojourners, pilgrims, we ought to talk like that and use that kind of language. Well, secondly, we ought to walk like aliens. Do our actions testify to our pilgrim identity? Do our deeds match our words? Do my deeds match? Match my words. Hmm. In chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as, here's the language again, sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of of visitation. Do our actions match our words? Do we walk like aliens? You know, Scripture speaks of our righteousness as an alien righteousness. Right? It's, not, it's foreign to us. The righteousness of Christ is an alien righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not going to earn us favor with God. We need an alien righteousness. That which is utterly unlike us and can only be provided by Christ Jesus. Are we walking like aliens? Are we living like aliens? Well, a third way that practically we can live like pilgrims is to make our homes into havens or refuges, right? In chapter 4 and verse 9, Peter exhorts the, the exiles to show hospitality without complaining? Are our homes places that people view as havens or refuges? What kind of place is a haven or a refuge? Well, my list here, and when I think of the beauties and the joys of home, good food, right? When I think of being at home, I think of eating well. Last night we had smoked barbecue, right? Sitting around the table breaking bread with the people of God, enjoying good food. Joy and celebration. The joy and celebration characterize our homes. My memories of home are filled with memories of joy and all the celebrations that take place at home. Birthdays, weddings, graduations. Joy and celebration. Healing. Anybody ever been bedridden, had surgery, laid in the bed in your home, and had people wait on you 
hand and foot, when you were incapacitated, then you associate home with a place of healing, right? In my bed, while my wife brings me soup or ministers to my many needs, I was healed. Protection, right? Something comforting at night about walking through the house and locking the doors and knowing that in my home, uh, we trust in horse, not in horses and chariots, but the name of the Lord our God, but there is a sense in which we feel protected in the confines of our home, right? Particularly as a child, I always felt safe. My father was at home. I knew I was safe. Daddy was there. Love and friendship. When I think of home, I think of love and friendship. The kindred spirit that I share with my siblings and with my parents and all the blessings that accompanies that love and friendship. I have been the beneficiary of much kindness in my life, not for anything that I've done, but because I had a godly father and a godly mother and brothers and sisters who had godly testimonies and their goodness benefited me. Love and friendship. Remembrance, right? It's what we do at home, isn't it? We remember, sit around and tell stories. <laughs> Should have been at Nana's house last night and heard all the stories of mayhem that took place on that farm growing up as a child, right? Remembering. Somehow we don't remember all the pain. We just remember all the things that were funny, right? Laughter is a, brings joy to our souls. It's a balm, and so we remember. Home is a place of wise counsel and deliberation. Right? Anybody ever pick up the phone and call your father when you're in great need? Or your mother? Mother, what should I do? Dad, what, what do I do? I think that's what I miss most about my father being gone is not being able to pick up the telephone and say, Dad, what should I do? I could always count on receiving wise counsel. Or perhaps when the way wasn't even clear to him, we could sit around the table and discuss what should we do? Sometimes take out the legal pad, right, and draw a line down the middle. And the pros and the cons. And godly decision making. Wise counsel and deliberation. I'm reading aloud one of Tokian's books to Ethan, my youngest. And one of the things I love most about his writing is his descriptions of the homes in his literature, right? Home is always a place of refuge in the world that Tolkien writes about. The last homely house, he calls the house of the wise old Elrond. Well, I think Tolkien's got a biblical view of home and hospitality, a place where there is good food and joy and celebration, healing, protection, love and friendship, remembrance and wise counsel. So, our application as we depart this week is for those three things. As we meditate, as we ruminate on 1 Peter, this week, may you and I talk like aliens. May we walk like aliens. And may we be deliberately making our homes into places of haven and refuge. I mean, the Christians of Peter's day were dispersed across Asia Minor in the midst of a pagan culture. Well, increasingly, even here in what we're now calling a post-Christian nation, right? God's people are scattered in the midst of a nation that is pagan. So homes ought to be places of refuge in the midst of a pagan culture. Would you pray with me? God our Father, we think of the Apostle Peter and are encouraged. Jesus said to him, in their last meeting, follow me. And Peter counted the cost. He knew from that day where the road would end. That he would suffer much. 
And yet he followed Christ anyway. Lord, we don't know what lies ahead. We don't know what today holds. We know that like Peter, we will encounter suffering in this life under the sun. Would you equip us that we might face such suffering with hope, remembering that this is not our home, that we are a pilgrim people passing through. May we set our hearts and our eyes on the things that are above and loosen our grip on the here and now. Forgive us, Father, for making idols of our homes, of safety, of any of the other temporal blessings that we enjoy here under the sun. And may we seek that which is of supreme importance to secure our citizenship in heaven. May we long, Father, to do right, to be holy because You are holy. And may this week, may we guard our tongues and speak as aliens. As we walk in the way, Father, may we redeem the time that the unbelievers, the ungodly, will look at us and marvel and question us about the hope that is within us, that we might have opportunity to speak to them about the good news of the gospel. Lord, we pray that our homes would be places of refuge for a weary and battered people. Would we know that we cannot walk the pilgrim's path alone? We are in need of close companions. And so, Father, would we cultivate friendships in our families and amongst the family of God that we might lean on one another and love one another, bear one another's burdens. Father, we commit the lessons that we have drawn from Scripture to Your care. Lord, use it for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.